Amen. We welcome you this morning. You who are visiting, we thank you for coming. If you will join us in worshiping our God, our Savior, Jesus Christ today. Amen. Will you 
you stand with us? And he knows our name. Praise God. Just nasty 
and you may be seated. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody, even though it's freezing in here. If anybody gets up and leaves, I, I won't judge. I mean, I can see you, but I understand. If you're cold, if you need a coat, you're not going to hurt anybody's feelings. But, um, you know, it's, it's, boy, heat is something. I'll tell you what, they say that one of the greatest inventions wasn't like the internet, which, you know, I think this was written before that. It wasn't color television, it wasn't the telephone, it was heating and cooling. Because you couldn't really live in Death Valley or lots of parts of Arizona until you have central air and, you know, climate control. So, and in times like this reminds us that, hey, it's nice to have climate control. So we'll, we'll pray that God fixes our boiler and that uh, we, he puts the right people here to get it done. But uh, in spite of all that, it's just great to see everybody. Uh, the sun's shining and... Uh, you know, praise the Lord for another day. Let's go to God in prayer. Um, our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day, Lord, and we ask that you be with us here. Um, guide our hearts towards you. Help us to hear from you and um, give you all the glory for everything. It's your name we pray. Amen. And before I get started, Roy has an announcement he'd like to, to give. So today's lesson is on recovering your sight. Now, she's out in the lobby, but I know our, our sister April had a, a couple of bouts with you know, vision-related things, and praise the Lord, he restored her sight. And kind of like you know, when, if you miss the, the finer things in life, like climate control, boy, losing your sight, that's the window to your soul. I, I heard Ray Comfort, he was, he was preaching out in uh, California, talking to kids, usually college kids, on the sidewalk, and one question he had that really stuck with me, he said, would you give your eyes for a million bucks? Kids are like, no. How about 10 million? No. How about 100 million? There's not enough money in the world that would make me give my eyes. What's, star what's really stark about that, though, is that what did Jesus say if your eyes are offending you and causing you to sin? Get rid of them. Because it's better to go through life without vision than to spend eternity apart from Christ, in hell, apart from God. So when you look at things that really, really matter, just you know, things like your sight, your, your physical health, and not everybody's blessed with those things. You know, there's many, many, I mean, one of my heroes in the faith is, is Nick Vujicic, who was born without arms and legs. Um, I just what a powerful, powerful witness for the Lord. See, God can work through anything. And God, can, God gets all the glory. That's the point, is that no matter what we're doing, God has to get the glory. Because he's the author of everything, he's the source of everything, and without him, you know, nothing would exist that does exist. And because he loves us, he makes a way that, you know, if you're on this earth right now, with, if, you're, if your body's broken in eternity, it's not going to be the case. A couple of things here, though. You know, talking about vision, I just went to the eye doctor a while ago, and I didn't bring them up here, but I'm to the point now where I start to need cheaters, you know, things so I can see. I'm 41, and, and my, the eye doctor kept saying, wow, usually it's 43 or 44, but whatever. He, he's not very nice. <laughs> he just isn't. I, I mean, I stare at a computer all day at work, and that might have something to do with it, that my eyes are kind of getting fatigued a little bit early. But yeah, I got to break out the cheaters every once in a while, or, you know, my daughter will, or my son will show me something, and I have to, I'm like, whoa, slow down. Let's kind of... Let my eyes focus a little. But here's a few things. If you're like me, if you're starting to have vision issues, there's eight things you can do to improve your vision. This is today's current event. This is from Versant Health, their website, back in December of 2020. Number one, and I've never thought of this, eat for your eyes. You're the saying, like, eat carrots, it's good for your eyes. Well, that's, that's actually true. 
the more you can eat with antioxidants in them, keeps your eye tissue and things healthy. Number two, exercise your eyes. Now, I don't know about you guys, but there's certain things, like I get real motion sick. Anybody else get motion sick? Like if you want to make me turn green, take me to an IMAX theater. Or like at Disney, there's certain rides that I just, I just can't look at it. Uh, my boy's the same way. There's certain rides that are awesome, but we don't want any part of. So we kind of hang out on the bench while uh, my wife and daughter go ride it. But there's things that you're supposed to do. You're supposed to look up and down and make circles. with. Like you can actually do physical exercises for your eyes. I didn't know that. Three, full body exercise, just keeping your blood flowing good because there's so many little blood vessels and nerves inside of your eyes, it's staggering. And, you know, if you have issues with blood flow or cholesterol buildup in your, in your arteries, it actually shows up in your eyes. I, I guess there's, people can tell whether you have ex excess cholesterol by looking in your eyeballs because they can see the plaque build. I, I didn't know that, but I've heard that from a few different sources. Now, here's a big one, rest them. So when you're at work and you stare at a computer screen all day like I typically do, you're supposed to close your eyes for a few minutes at least once an hour. Like my watch yells at me and tells me to stand up. If you have one of these fancy watches, it'll tell you to stand up. You know, you got to move around a little bit. So maybe what you should do is stand up and then close your eyes like that. And then, but just don't try not to walk around. People will think you're nuts. But apparently you're supposed to rest your eyes once an hour too. So if you're at work and your boss catches you napping, just tell them, hey, look, this is for my health care. I got to take a few minutes every hour and close my eyes. And, you know, if you're snoring, well, that's on you. Number five, get enough sleep. Sleep is so powerful. You know, God made us the way we are. He, he made, get made night and day, and he told us to take at least one day a week for rest. Um, but he wants us to sleep. And sleeping really improves the muscle tone, again, blood flow. There's so many things connected with good sleep. Cre and this, is, this one made me laugh. Create eye-friendly surroundings. So don't get a bunch of chlorine in your eyes. That's, that's a pro tip. You know, I, I used to work in a cheese factory in college, and we had this stuff called Chlormate. It was like Clorox on steroids. But if that stuff got in your eye, it was not a pleasant day. So keep chemicals and things out of your eyes. Uh, dim lights, like my dad always used to yell at me when we'd be working on something like a car or a project. He'd say, I need light. I'm like, why do you need light, dad? Because when you're little, like you can like read in the dark. It's not a thing. But as you get older, I find myself flipping lights on now that I never really used to or turning up the dimming lights on the porch. You know, your eyes need light so you can see a little bit better. Avoid smoking. I guess the smoke, I guess... You know, it does a lot to your, your vessels and arteries, but it can mess your eyes up too. And then number eight, of course, written by a healthcare company, get regular eye exams. So there's, I mean, these are just basic human things you can do for your eyes and for your sight. Because again, remember the question that Ray Comfort was asking, now he was tying it to spiritual matters, but what would you give for your eyes? You know, God said, hey, your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit, try to take care of it. And we'll never be perfect. We're never gonna be, you know, always in 100% physical health. You know, we live in a fallen world where there's sin and death. But if there's little things you can do to take care of your eyes, the more the better. So I already kind of mentioned April with her, you know, vision journey where she can see again. Praise the Lord for that. But has anybody else had any really miraculous vision improvement that ever happened to anybody? Just off the top, you know, I, I didn't, it's not part of my sermon. I was just wondering. But we're going to be in Luke chapter 18, so if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke 18. I don't know what page it is in the Pew Bible, but we're going to stay in Luke 18, and if, if, if you've never heard me speak before, we stay real close to the Scripture, because again, I mean, God's words are better than mine, and it's always going to be that way. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 18, we're going to start at verse 35. This one caught me, and, and these, are the, these are the chapters that are leading up to Jesus' you know, final entrance into Jerusalem before the crucifixion which next week is going to be Palm Sunday. So that's, I'm trying to, I tried to build these last few sermons up around that as leading up to Jesus' triumphal entry in Palm Sunday. So Luke 18, we're going to start at verse 35. He heals a blind beggar. As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. 
Now, in those days, I don't think they had Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid. And if you wanted to eat, you would beg. And especially if you were blind. Because, again, you know, there, I don't think there was these fancy Braille computers and things like that now that people have. But the point is, this man you know, needed the generosity of strangers just to live so he could eat. And this is what he was doing. So he was sitting by the roadside begging. Verse 36, and he heard, and hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. So the man knew that he could tell that there was a commotion. Like people were excited. You know, when Jesus went, and he, I, we went to, um, you know, in Canton, Ohio is the Football Hall of Fame. Anybody ever been there? Well, we went to the Hall of Fame game one year when uh, Michael Strahan was getting inducted into the Hall of Fame. And there happened to be a young man there who's a celebrity. His name's Usher. He's an R&B singer. He's also a part owner of the Cavs, or at least he was. I don't know if he sold any of his shares. But I was in line for concessions, and I heard a hubbub, you know, like, and I saw this blob of people coming by. And I saw these security guards just like part in the Red Sea, kind of everybody was in line, back when you could stand in line. People were in line waiting to get like a hot dog or nachos or, you know, something that isn't good for your eyeballs. But anyway, we were in line, and just this mass of humanity came through. And I'm, I'm a taller guy, and I could see over the crowd, and there was this usher. I, I mean, I could, I could have ate a turnip off of his head. He's about that big. Little good. All the guy wanted was mustard for his hot dog. That's all he wanted. But it took literally a, a, a group of security guards just so this man could walk in public without getting mobbed. Well, what do you think Jesus was like back in the day? That's why he literally had to get on a boat and said, just get me out. I mean, he's God. He can do anything. But he said, just get me out of here, guys. Let's, let's go. And often he had to go by himself in the wilderness just to get away from the crowd. If you read scripture, crowds would just, if they knew Jesus was there, they were there. So I don't know if there was a Jewish paparazzi. I don't know what they would have been called. But if Jesus was around, things were happening. People were being cleansed of demons People's sickness were being taken away. People were recovering their sight. People knew who Jesus was. There is, it is an undisputed historical fact that Jesus of Nazareth lived and was on this earth. And there's a lot of also even secular historical proof that he also raised from the dead. That's, that's a topic for a later thing. But when Jesus, and remember, in, in the Bible it says that if, if we were to write down everything that Jesus did when he was here on earth, there wouldn't be enough room on the earth to fill up the, the, you know, to hold the books. Now, of course, that was some flowery language, but the point is, when he was here, he was working. And thankfully, he's still alive, and he's still working. All through all this, and we've talked about this a lot, through this pandemic, as awful as it was, people have lost loved ones, people have lost life, businesses have shut down. Kingsway's still here. We got a job to do, brothers and sisters. And I don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but when you look at the timing and how God has orchestrated the events to keep our small congregation here, and seeing so many people here today, really, you know, it's really awesome to see what God has done. So we're here, we're not going anywhere, and we've got a job to do. So, you know, and that's not because of our own power, that's because of Christ. The man that when he walked the earth, that there was just crowds of people following him, he loves you so much, he died for you, and he's living in your heart right now if you're saved. Isn't that amazing? He's a lot better than Usher, I can tell you that. I'm sure he's a nice young man. He's probably older than me, I don't know. But anyway, it, it just was amazing to see. The guy just wanted mustard for a hot dog, and it took a security detail to get there. Uh, that was the life of Jesus. When, once, once word got out that he was there, that's, it had to be worse than that. There thousands of people following him. So this blind beggar knew who Jesus was. And this is what he did. Verse 38, he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So, Jesus, son of David. Now, what was unique about calling him a son of David? David's been dead for, you know, a thousand years. Because they knew that the Messiah was going to come out of the house of David. You know, the Jewish scholars knew that this was going to be the lineage of the Messiah. So he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So he was not afraid. Now, anybody know what the technical term is for fear of speaking out or speaking in public? 
I had to look it up. It's called glossophobia. Interesting term. But it's the fear of speaking in public. And it's, it's been said that it affects at least four out of ten Americans. And I think at least three or four others weren't honest when they answered the question. Because speaking in public, I mean, I've, I'm a weirdo. I, I went, since I was 11, I enjoy this stuff, is speaking in public. But uh, when people have to speak their mind... Not so much like standing up in front of a group of people, but what if you're in a, in, a, in a small group? Now, once you're comfortable, and, and we'll touch on this a little bit more, it gets a little bit easier. But, I mean, it's, I've heard people say they would rather speak to thousands than speak to a group of children in Sunday school. So there's many, many different forms that this can take, but I remember as a kid, and, and Paula laughed at me for this, my, my parents were having a garage sale. Anybody still do garage sales? Yeah, well, I had my toys out. I was five, and I, I, when I was little, He-Man was a thing. And they were ugly, but they, I liked them. Now it's, then, it, then it went to He-Man, G.I. Joe, Ninja Turtles. There was a whole progression there. But I had my He-Man toys, and I was playing with them, and I set them down on a table at the garage sale. And this little boy came up and grabbed them, and he said, Mom, can I have these? And she said, No, those are ugly. Put them down. And they, they were ugly. But I saw this kid grab him, and I'm standing right there, and I didn't have the courage to say, oh, those are mine. I would have let that kid take my toys and walk as a five-year-old. It, for me, it was scary to ask for what I want. And if you know me now, you, you probably you know, might not believe that, but that, that's, that's me. And I still, to this day, am afraid to ask for what I want, either A, because I'm putting somebody out, or B, what if they say no? So, and that's just, that's just my nature. I'm not, by, I'm not naturally someone that just, you know, is not afraid to say what they want. So that's glossophobia. Now, I've never had a fear of public speaking, but there, I think there's more levels to it than what that is. Mark Twain said, there are two types of speakers, those who get nervous and those who are liars. And for me, you know, again, I enjoy speaking in public. I, I have since I was a child, but before I come up and do a message, I'm always nervous. Like, what, you know, what if I screw up? What if I say the wrong thing? What if I offend somebody? But if I'm sticking to the word of God, even if I do offend somebody, you know, that's just the way it is. And, and the Bible tells us that the Bible is offensive to a lot of people. It was back when Jesus was walking the earth, and it is to this day. So we can't be afraid to speak the truth of what the Bible says. Now, if I offend somebody by my own, you know, thoughts and feelings and you know, machinations on something, well then, yeah, that's a problem. But if we're reading right from Scripture, you know, the Bible is a two-edged sword. So, you know, if you get nervous, if you're afraid to speak up, you're not alone, okay? And there's a few things. I went to a website called Healthline. I was looking at, okay, what are some things to do to help with glossophobia, whether it's speaking in public or speaking up for what you want in, like, a group setting or at work? One thing is if, if you have to give a presentation... Uh, we were friends, or Paula was friends with a girl whose uh, husband was a VP at a major company, and he had to take like anti-migraine medication before board meetings because he got so nervous to present something to the board of directors of this company. So, I mean, this is a real thing, and it affects people in all walks of life. I remember Wilt Chamberlain used to throw up before his basketball games. He's one of the greatest players ever. He would be just as dominant in today's game as he was back when he played. So if you're nervous, that's just your body getting ready to perform a task. So don't feel that it's a sign of weakness if you're nervous. But ways to kind of get around, like, and this will make sense. I know we're not all going to be public speakers, but number one is know your material. If you don't know what you're talking about, it's scary. And I've, I have won it before. And not so much from the pulpit, but in school. Um, you know, I used to get made fun of again for doing a paper 10 minutes before class started. You know, I'd run to the computer lab at college and knock it out and turn in garbage. Not my proudest moment. But, you know, if you know your material, it's a lot less scary to turn that thing in or to, to present something. The, the worst thing is to say, hey, I've got a great idea, have not researched it, present it to somebody, and they're like, oh, we've already done that. You must not have been paying attention, or, you know, that's a terrible idea. So you don't want to call your shot beforehand. You really got to put the time and work in and prepare for something. Number two, script your presentation. So it's okay to have, you know, I, I'm not just winging it. I've got notes, pages of notes. 
So script it out. Number three is practice often. Again, I, I, this will all make sense here in a little bit. So practice often. You know, do repetitions, drill it. Do you think Tiger Woods swung a golf club, you know, just naturally as a child? No. Just millions upon millions of swings. Do you think LeBron, you know, just, you know, was born and, you know, could shoot free throws the way he does? No, he shot millions of shots. You know, it takes repetition. Also, a, a thing to do, and this is, boy, this is the hardest for me, is videotape your presentation. Or sit down. Now we all have this fancy computer in our pocket, most of us. You can record yourself all day. So if you have to go do something, if you got to present something, you know, look at your body language. Look at how you present yourself. You know, most communication is nonverbal. You know, it's not what you say, it's how you say it and how you look saying it. So if you're, if you're like this and you're, you know, kicking rocks down the road and you're presenting something, no, but, you know, people don't care. But if your shoulder blades are down, your chest is out, and you stand tall and you present something with authority, you know, you could read a McDonald's menu and it sounds like you know what you're doing. And if it's a dollar menu, you know, maybe, you know, there's some sense there. But so video your presentation, look at how you carry yourself, look at what you're doing. And another one is, now this one is good. We call it uh, preparing for objections in business. Think ahead of time of audience questions or objections because you don't want to get caught off guard. What do attorneys say? Never ask a question you don't already know the answer to. Have you ever heard that before? Now that's if you're trying to prove a case, but think about this. If you're going to present something to somebody you want to have already have rehearsed the potential objections or problems with what you're stating. Well, we, you know, what about this? Well, I'm glad you asked that because then I ran this analysis and this is what makes sense. Well, what about X, Y, Z? Well, that's a good point, and a lot of people felt that way, but after they did things the way I'm proposing, this is the outcome, and they felt a lot better. That's called the feel-felt-found method, by the way. So I'm, I'm dropping business nuggets on you here if you care. Um, then there's the herd technique. Well, you know, a lot of people felt that way, but now after doing this approach that we're talking about, they feel, you know, it really changed their life. So you, you start to think of objections in your head. And this is, these are all just little, you know, tips, you know, not from scripture totally, about how to feel better about speaking up and asking for what you want and asserting yourself is that you got to feel confident that you know what you're talking about, you've done it a few times before, and you know what the potential objections are. We're going to come back to this in a little bit, so that, that wasn't just a, a complete waste of your time there. Okay, back to Scripture. We're at Luke 18 and 39 through 40a. So 39 said, And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. So people were like, you know, mister, you're being annoying. You know, you're, you're, you're making everybody uncomfortable here, yelling at Jesus. Can't you see he's an important, you know, don't you know he's an important guy? You know, you're, you're less than. Sometimes the world will make you feel that way when you try to speak up for what you know is right. You know, just, just be quiet, stay in your corner. You know, you're not worth it. Don't ask for anything. You're bothering him. He's too important. But Jesus stopped. And I would bet the entourage of people around him, it was, you know, they all put the brakes on too. So he stopped and he said, bring him to me. Uh, Jesus has done this many times. If you read through, you know, the working of Jesus, if you cry out to him, what does he do? He stops. Isn't that something? You know, if I would have cried out to Usher, you know, me and the other, all the other teenage girls around and stuff, He's not going to stop for me. He's going to keep his head down, put his mustard on his hot dog, and keep going. He's got better stuff to do. You know, I'm, I'm not going to stop. If someone, well, it depends on who it is, but if someone starts yelling at me, you know, I don't know what they want. But Jesus knew. He said, well, stop and bring him to me. So that's the first part of verse 40. And what's, I guess what, what made me stop and think about this too, this man, you know, after he got shushed by the people around Jesus, did he quit? No. Why do you think he was so persistent? Because he knew Jesus could fix it, didn't he? 
So this man knew that he was that who he was asking to have mercy upon him had the ability to get it done. So he had faith right from, the, oh, Jesus of Nazareth asked for what he wanted persistently. And even if people are in front of him, he can't see. People are in front of him telling him to be quiet. He got even more insistent about it. There's a guy from this area from Cleveland, but he went to Stowe Monroe Falls High School. He's a professional boxer. His name's Sean Porter. I love listening to his podcast. I'm a sports guy, if you haven't figured that out yet. But he, in boxing, you have to basically demand that somebody fight you. It's not like a, a league of sports where, you know, someone has a league where there's games, where there's a schedule. You have to basically get in, under someone's skin to make them want to fight you. And then, of course, there's money involved. But there's this guy, he keeps trying to fight, and this guy doesn't want to fight him, probably because he's afraid of losing. But his quote is, closed mouths don't get fed. Anybody ever see baby birds in a nest? Little fuzzballs. But if if you're by, they're just, boop, you know, their mouth's open. You know, because they know if your mouth is closed, you're not going to eat. You know, ever see puppies when they're born trying to nurse? It is a free-for-all. And that poor mom is just laying there like, oh my goodness, there's ten of you. Very patient, but closed mouths don't get fed. So this man knew, and we should know in our Christian walk, that closed mouths don't get fed. So he kept at it. He said, you know, son of man, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And then this is part B. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. Now, do you think Jesus knew what he wanted ahead of time? Yeah, he knew what he wanted. Just like, but he did the same thing to the woman that had the bleeding ailment for years. She touched his shirt, or his garment, his robe, and he stopped. And, he, and this is what's amazing about Jesus. Remember, we're told to confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord. You know, we have the ordinance of baptism, of communion, of, you know, God, you know, our works can never save us, but God commands us to be able to express our love and devotion for him. Also, he says that if you deny me before men, I'm going to deny you before my father. So Jesus stops, and he says, what is it that you want? He makes him ask. And he said, Lord, let me recover my sight. Verse 42, and Jesus said to him, recover your sight, your faith has made you well. So this man had faith before Jesus stopped, before he pulled him over, before he asked what he wanted. What's really important, too, is we get ready to celebrate Easter. You know, is that what, do we really believe what we're celebrating? Or is it about the bunny and the chocolate and those Cadbury eggs that are delicious and those, you know, there's so many things about Easter that have nothing to do with the real reason about it. And, and those things are fun. You know, I'm not putting those things down, but... You know, do we really believe, if we cry out to Jesus, that he cares, that he'll stop and listen, and that he has the power to do what we're asking? Or are there times where we're afraid to ask God something because we don't want to get let down? I know I feel that way at times. They're like, well, does he really care about this issue? Is this really something that God wants? We're told to ask and be persistent about it. It's like me as a kid watching some other kid almost walk off with my He-Man toys. Am I looking at Jesus and saying, like I'm just too nervous to say anything. I'm too nervous to ask. And praise the Lord for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you know, I mean that, 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 he says the Holy Spirit, you know, prays with, with utterings and groanings that, you know, he knows what we need. But he still wants us to ask. So this man's faith was there. And Jesus said, it's your faith that made you well. Because I don't go to somebody with a problem that can't solve it. Then you're just gossiping. Like if you're at work and you need something done, and this is a silly thing, but my desk at work, I need a wall. Because I'm in a bank branch that's very noisy. People are sitting down to have conversations with me about real private things. And you hear somebody laughing and joking with the tellers, you know, 30 feet away. It'd be nice if I had a wall and a door. And I've been rattling cages for years on this to get this done. 
and it would make no difference if I just complained to one of my coworkers about it for years. If I just said, oh man, can you believe I don't have a door to make this one office more private? What you got to do is go right to the source. You know, if, if somebody, if a brother's offending you, if you run and tell everybody else about the problem, but don't do what we're prescribed to do biblically, you know, get a couple of witnesses with you, do it in love, do it the way the Bible says, you're just gossiping, right? So we got to have the courage to go right to the source of who can help us. You know, when that veil was ripped in two, when Christ died on the cross, what a powerful symbol that you should have been picked up by the children of Israel, that that, that veil separated people from the holiest of holies. You could not go there unless you were the high priest at a certain time of year, and they even tied a rope around that guy's waist in case he fell dead in there. But when Christ died for your sins, that barrier between you and direct access to the king of kings, to the creator of the universe, was ripped in half. And praise the Lord, because of the love of Christ and God and the Holy Spirit that had this plan before the foundation of the earth, we can go right to the source of everything. You know, there's not like silos, like, okay, like if you look at, when when human beings make things, you know, we're not that creative. But, you know, in, in, in Greek mythology and in Roman times when Paul was preaching, there was just statues of gods everywhere. Like, this is the god of this, or this is the patron saint of this, or this is... We don't need to do that. First of all, that's nonsense. We have the creator and sustainer of everything that is asking us to want to talk to him. And just like Jesus did, even though there was a mob of people and he had things to do, he'll stop and he'll say, what what do you want? Isn't that just amazing? That and, and the parable of the prodigal son where God is literally sitting on the front porch waiting for his son to come home who spit in his face, wished he was dead and took his money and left and blew it on who knows what. God is still sitting on that front porch watching for you and for me. And he wants a relationship with us. We've been given the right to be called children of God. So there is no better source of anything that we can ever go to than that right there. And that's a privilege that we have. So do we find ourselves in a moment of honesty? Are we afraid to approach God and ask for things? I, mean, I think that's, that's quite possible. Maybe there's a piece of our, of our lives. Maybe there's a sin we can't get through. Maybe there's a worry about a family member or a friend or just something that we're dealing with. Have we gone directly to the Father and asked him about it? You know, if I was the blind guy in, in total transparency, I might have shut my mouth after the first time I was told to be quiet because I'm a, I, was, I bet I would have been afraid to speak up for what I really wanted. But it's just amazing how immediate Jesus' response was. Now, what did this man do after he received his sight? Let's keep reading. Verse 43, And immediately... He recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. So he turned a gift, a miracle, right back into praise to the author and sustainer of everything. And it wasn't just like a private thing for him. People saw this, and it became a witness for people around. They praised God, seeing what God had done. In Sunday school, in Bob's class, we talked about this. That, you know, sometimes if you get to worrying about things, if things are really stressful or bothersome, when God does answer a prayer and you know it, you know, it's a a miracle from God, do we stop and even thank him? Or, like like we were joking about, are we just on to the next? Like, okay, that was good, but now, but this, now, this is what needs attention. Do we ever even take a second to stop, back up, and just thank God for what he's done? You know, do we thank him for our family, for our children, for our friends, for our job that we have, for the fact that we can sit here without persecution? You know, there's people still to, I mean, I, I heard a story, I think it was in, um, was it Nigeria, where 300 young girls were taken? They were at school, and a militant group came through and took 
300 girls. Are we grateful that we live here? Or are we always looking at, well, what can someone else do for me? If only this were fixed. If only, if only, if only. Boy, we are in a golden age right now of freedom and the ability to, to just to assemble together and preach the word of God in a public forum. So praise the Lord for that. Are we grateful for that? Or are we always worried about, well, what's going to happen down the road? I know I fall into that trap of worrying about what's next. So do we stop and praise the Lord for what he has done? Do we stop and glorify him? So if you're like me, when I was younger especially, that you know, maybe you're afraid to ask for things, or maybe you, know, you realize who God is, and maybe it's scary to approach him. And sometimes people, if they've had a bad relationship with their, with their father here, or maybe no relationship, Sometimes we do the thing where we project God onto people that were in our lives as father figures. But if you read the Bible, you know, that's not him. You know, I'm not perfect. My kids will tell you. Um, but God is perfect, and he's our perfect heavenly father. So how do we get the courage to be like this man who recovered his sight because he persistently chased after the king of kings? Well, that little list I, I kind of read off earlier about public speaking, about things to do, When you see things like this in life, try to think of a scriptural backup to it. And if it's not in the Bible, then toss it out. But it's really cool to see how if things actually work, it's usually in the Bible. Like if you read Proverbs, and if you lived your your personal finance and business life exactly the way King Solomon laid it out, you're going to be really successful. And John Maxwell is one of the most well-known management and leadership coaches in the country, He's a Christian. And people ask him, where do you get your material? The Proverbs, the Bible. And they kind of roll their eyes and groan. Oh, man. It works. If you do the things that the Bible says to do because God said it, it's going to work. Because he knows us, doesn't he? He made us. He made everything. He set the law of gravity. He set the speed of light. You know, He has control over it, can manipulate it as he chooses. But he put things in order the way he wanted them to be done. And if we do what he says to do, things tend to work. Remember, read the owner's manual. Okay, so let's go back here. Now, the first bullet point I read was know your material. So how does this correlate to us being not afraid to ask God for... How can you know the material of who our Father is? Read it, yeah. Most printed, translated book ever. Not even close. This right here. This Bible. The the Bible that we use in church. They're everywhere. In this country, they're everywhere. Now, if you're in North Korea, you treat it like it's worth $10 million and hide it. Because if they find it, it's gone. Again, praise the Lord that we live where we do, when we do. That this is just on every street corner. In every hotel desk drawer, there's a Gideon Bible in there. So we we really are blessed to live where we live and have the things that we do. So know your material. Uh, 2 Timothy 3. I'm going to read this to you here. 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17. But as, as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So what the Apostle Paul was writing to his Timothy, his protege, was ever since you were a little kid, and I believe it was his mother and his grandmother that were his spiritual influencers, they were teaching him the law ever since he was a little kid. And he says, look, you know it, you can read it, and when you read the letters, when you know what's going on, when you follow the scriptures, it's going to make you a better person because it is the word of God. It, is, it teaches you about salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And it equips you to be a righteous person. Again, we have the ultimate owner's manual for life. And if you follow the scriptures... You know, things are going to work out for you. So if you're nervous about approaching God, read the material. 
It tells you over and over and over again, seek, ask, knock. God is a loving God. And Jesus, before he was crucified again, he was looking at Jerusalem and said, I just want to bring you under my wings like a hen does to her chicks. Like God doesn't need us, but he loves us. And he's saying, look, I love you. I died for you. I want to talk to you. So if we know our material, we're going to approach God more confidently because we know that he already wants us there. Again, praise the Lord for that. Now, the, the other bullet point was script of presentation. Okay. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. Now, think of this in context of approaching God or being a witness for God. You know, for your materials that you have, you know, we don't want to be out there, you know, shooting from the hip, like I was talking about earlier. So 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, this is the Apostle Paul here. He says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So again, Paul was a smart guy. Like he was top of the class in Hebrew school. And he said that. He read his credentials off about how he studied under the best people. Like if you were, grew up in Japan, it was really big there too. It was the pre-K you went to determined the kindergarten, which determined the primary school. And then if you get to Tokyo University, you could basically pick your job. It's not as that rigid in, in the United States. I mean, there's uh, the guy that's the best at what I do at my company. You know, he doesn't have a college degree. You know, there's a little bit more merit-based. But there, in that theocracy, you know, where you studied under and who you learned from did a lot for your position. And Paul, you know, read his credentials to him before. But he said that when I came to you, all I care about is knowing Jesus Christ and that he was crucified for you. That's all that matters. Verse 3, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and with much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So if you want things to get done, you can have the best speech of all time. But if the Holy Spirit isn't in it, it does not matter. So if you want to come in a situation with power, if you want to approach the throne of God with power, if you want to speak to a group of people with true power, brothers and sisters, it's not your words. It's the power of Christ and the Holy Spirit. And surrendering and submitting your life to that power is what brings the increase. I've used the example a few times before of people that come to Christ. It has nothing to do with the eloquence of the speaker. It's the Holy Spirit gets you. And if you want the Holy Spirit to act, humble yourself. So your script of a presentation, know who Christ is and whom him crucified. And trust him for the increase. Now practice often. This one is really popular in the homeschool settings. This is in Deuteronomy 11, 18 through 21. So any homeschoolers out there probably already know this one. But Deuteronomy 11, 18 through 21 says, You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as, frontless, as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house, when you are walking by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give them, as long as the heavens are above the earth. Now that again, this was written directly to the children of Israel about the promised land. But the pattern here is that practice often, you know, instead of sitting down and, you know, reading off your elevator pitch to sell something to somebody, why not memorize scripture? You know, put something in your head over and over and over again. And then if you're parents with children, when you're with your children, talk about Jesus in the morning, while you're walking to school, while you're, if you homeschool, while you're eating lunch or dinner together, when they're at home at night. You know, your conversation and the way that you live your life should be like you're wearing a sign for Christ on your head. And that's a challenge to me because, man, there's other things to worry about, isn't there? There's other things to do. 
you know, there's work and then there's, you know, piano lessons and gymnastics and swimming and, you know, st- stuff has to get done around the house. But when you hear about people, like I'm, my great-grandfather that passed away in his 90s, he always said, it's always me and the Lord. So his life, the way he lived his life, and he'll tell you this to your face, was that he walks with the Lord on a daily basis. Now, he's been in heaven for, you know, 20-some years now. But I still remember the impact my great-grandfather had on me as a kid because it was always him and the Lord. So there's, you know, again, there's things that you can do without having to, you know, don't disqualify yourself saying, well, I don't know enough to talk to my family or friends or kids. You know, remember what Paul said. It's Christ crucified. That's it. You know, so whenever you have a conversation, instead of, you know, flexing your muscles and said, look what I did, you know, say, hey, praise the Lord. You know, I guess, you know, God, God did this, not I did this. Just simple things like that, but make it consistent. And then you'll, and what you're doing is you're training your own brain, too, to say, you know what, you know, it is, it is the glory of God. This is a gift of the Lord. And he is a loving and generous God, so it'll make you more confident to go to him in the future. So practice often. Practice your gratitude to the Father. Practice telling somebody about what Jesus did, how he saved you. Keep it in the forefront of your mind. Remember, closed mouths don't get fed. Now, this one I'm going to let you off the hook. Videotape your presentation. You don't have to do that. So if you're worried about watching yourself on camera, don't sweat it. That's not in the Bible. So we're going to bleep over that one. The last one, though, work on questions and objections. Don't plan on having to answer to every problem. I fall into that trap sometimes. Like, I'm thinking of my answer before I let you finish. You're not going to know why bad things happen to good people. You're just not. You're not going to know why God chooses to heal some and not others. You're not going to know why, you know, those 300 girls were allowed to be taken in, in Nigeria, I believe. I'm sorry, anybody from Nigeria, if that wasn't where it happened. We're not going to have those answers. I mean, the blanket statement is we live in a fallen, sinful, broken world, which is true. But again, all we have to know is Jesus Christ and him crucified. And what's key about this, you know, you have two ears and one mouth. You're supposed to listen twice as much as you speak. That was hard for me, still hard for me. Proverbs had something to say about that. Proverbs 18.13 says, If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. So while someone starts to tell you something that's really important to them, and you basically cut them off to answer all the problems they have in the world without listening... Anybody else a fixer in here? Who's a, yeah, yeah. It doesn't go too well, does it? Especially when your spouse or your loved one just wants to tell you what happened to them without you hopping in trying to fix it right away. It generally doesn't go too well. So it is our folly and shame if we just verbally beat people down without listening to them. Remember the way the Apostle Paul approached it? He said, I came with weakness and fear and trembling you don't come to somebody you know, presenting the gospel in, in fear and trembling if you're just you know, shooting them down every time they have an objection to Christianity too. It's okay to listen. You don't have to agree with them, but listen. Because people want to feel heard, don't they? Jesus did. Jesus stopped. Like Jesus just could have went, walked by him and just healed the guy. And that would have been it. But he stopped the caravan, looked over and said, come here, what do you want? He listened He knew, and we know the answer to to fix everything, which is a relationship with Christ, but he still listened, and he said, what is it that you want? What can I do for you? What would you like? So if Jesus would stop what he was doing and ask people basic questions and listen for their response, you know, I think we can do the same, can't we? Unless, yeah, I think so. So then I'm going to flip this around to us. Are we listening to God? You know, if God gives us the answer we don't want to hear, do we just pretend we didn't hear it? Yeah. That's, I've got a lot of stories of that. You know, go upstairs and get dressed, then you come back upstairs and they're still on their iPad or something. Oh, I, I must have forgot. I missed that one. <laughs> That's happened a few times. So, you know, are we, are we listening to God or do we just kind of bleep over the stuff we don't want to hear? 
You know, I, I, I love with Elisha and uh, Naaman and what his servant said to him. He knew that there was a man in Israel that could restore, you know, heal his leprosy. He goes and he expects, you know, a big presentation, right? And all he gets is a servant of Elisha comes out and says, hey, go dip in that dirty river seven times and you'll be good. And he just, oh, he didn't want to hear that, did he? He's like, you could at least came out and like waved over me and made some big show. Maybe God's going to ask you to go dip in a river seven times that doesn't look too clean. Do we have the courage to listen? Well, if we go down through these bullets, if we know our material, if we read the Bible and we pray and we have a good relationship with Christ, even if it makes no sense, even if it's at the 11th hour, even if you feel like everything's about to, the rug's about to get pulled out from underneath you, isn't that kind of when God usually shows up? He got Gideon down to 300 people and they had clay pitchers and trumpets and torches and they took out a whole army. If it seems crazy and not possible, just wait. You know, if it's God's plan, it is going to happen. And guess what? Because it is crazy and impossible, who gets all the glory? God. So Naaman's servant had to say, uh, boss, if he would have done something flashy, you would have done it, right? Like, this is easy. Just, just listen. And he did it. And he was healed. So if God asks you to do something simple, and it doesn't make sense, and you would rather go you know, jump in a river seven times, do what he says. If you come to him asking, and he tells you the answer, but then you don't do what he says, it's like what he said about the, the, the two sons, where the dad says to, to both of his kids, hey, go work in the vineyard. And the one boy says, oh, all right, dad. And then he puts his headphones back on and watches his tablet and doesn't do it. And the other cat says, oh, I don't want to do that. But then he came to his senses and went out and did the work. Who did the will of his father? So we're not going to fool God. It, it, you know, if, he, if he's showing you something he wants you to do, and it's an answer to your prayers, and we don't have the courage to do it, or if we don't feel like it, or if it's inconvenient, you know, we can't blame God for where we're at. He's given us... Ultimately, he's given everybody a way of escape because this earth isn't going to be around forever. So we are a mist. It's going to vanish, but we have eternity. So have you accepted the free gift of salvation? You know, what we're going to celebrate here for Easter, that's everything. And if you haven't accepted that free gift of salvation, you're running on a hamster wheel. And then you're going to be eternally separated from God. But if you have accepted salvation, if Jesus is the Lord of your life, do we have the courage to ask him that his will be done in our life? Do we have that courage? Or is it, oh, but Lord, I don't want to give this up. You know, he provides a way. And if you want, truly want to be a part of his will and do what he says and live that close life with Christ, you know, do we have the courage to ask? And then once he tells us, are we going to be like Naaman and kind of turn our camel around and say, that's not what I wanted to hear? The beauty of grace, though, is that it's not, it's not a works-based salvation. And when that, when that temple veil was torn in half, that's grace. Because when you look at the Levitical law up until that point, it was do this, do this, do this, do this, sacrifice this. Um, if you don't listen, I'm going to throw you out. And there are still consequences for sin in this life, but our eternal destiny is paid in full by a loving, perfect God who died for us. That's what we're celebrating these next few weeks. So to prepare our hearts and minds, you know, start asking the Lord, Lord, am I afraid to ask you for what it is you want me to do with my life? Or am I taking a part of myself and hiding it? Am I scared? Am I not as courageous as the blind beggar that would, I wouldn't be able to call out for you repeatedly over the noise? Over the noise of the world, the people telling you you can't do it, you shouldn't do it, um, you know, God doesn't care about you, there is no God, can you drown out the noise and cry out to Jesus? Now we're going to have, uh, there's been somebody that asked to come forward and be anointed. And I, we'll put it out there for anybody else here before we pray. But if you, again, you know, the Bible in James 5 says, if, you, if you're sick, ask, call upon the elders. 
They'll anoint you with oil as a symbol of the Holy Spirit, and God will lift you up. Do we have the courage to do that, or is it scary? It's kind of like the, uh, you know, when the levee breaks, when there's an altar call at something, there's usually a couple of minutes of uncomfortable silence. I, I, one of Nick Vujicic's sermons at a prison was this way, and at a church was this way, where there's nothing, and he keeps saying, come on, guys, I know there's somebody here. Come on, guys. And, and then one gang member comes down, tosses his gun in a barrel, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one, right? So... You know, it is scary to ask, but once one person usually does it, you know, people feel more emboldened. So maybe where you're at right now, God's calling you to, if you've never come forward, come forward. If you need healing and you've always been afraid to ask, because what if God doesn't want to do it? You know, drop your fears, come to the Father. So let's go to God in prayer. Our Lord, thank you for giving this example of this blind man that was not afraid to persistently ask you for help. And Lord, help us to know that you are the author of everything. And your love is something that we can never wear out. We can't outlive it. We don't deserve it. And Lord, help us to know you and your heart enough to know that as a child of yours, if we are saved, you want us to petition you and ask. And Lord, help our hearts to ask for what your will is and not what our will is. And help us to be like the Apostle Paul that you know, we come to you with fear and trembling and we present you with just yourself, with Jesus Christ crucified and what we're going to be celebrating here Leading up to Easter, Father, is your willingness to say, not, your, not my will, Father, but yours be done. Because that means that we, you know, that don't deserve it, can have our sins paid in full and spend eternity with you in heaven. Lord, we just, I want to pray right now for the person that needs anointed. If there's anybody else that needs anointed, give them the courage to come forward. And more importantly, if someone's never been saved or they've backslidden or they're, they're worried about their relationship with you, um, give them the courage to raise their hand or come forward and ask for prayer as well. It's your name we pray. Amen. Is there another song? No? Okay. Mm-hmm. No. Can't ruin the moment singing praises. strength 
to the Lord, we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. Well, thank you, everybody. And is there anybody else that needed anointed? If they do, just raise your hand. But um, anything else? Thank you, everybody.